Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for our virtual event, Kennedy's Visit to Ireland in 1963. My name is Rachel Taylor and I am a programming librarian here at the Scranton Memorial Library. Tonight, we are very pleased and excited to welcome as our guest speaker, Sean Murphy, who is a scholar of Irish history and music. And through his talk this evening, he will explore John F. Kennedy's landmark visit to Ireland, which was his ancestral home, as well as the history of the Kennedy family in Ireland. I do ask that everyone please remain muted and refrain from using the group chat until the end of the talk, at which point we will open it up for questions. Uh, thank you so much to Sean for being with us tonight. And without further ado, here is Kennedy's visit to Ireland. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, so welcome everybody. And happy um, early St. Patrick's Day uh, to you all. So the first thing, I suppose, it's it's very appropriate to be um, you know, to be having this uh, uh, talk tonight, given that this is the uh, 60th, 60th anniversary of the uh, visit uh, of J JFK to, uh, to Ireland. Um, give you an idea of what I'm going to do tonight. I have a couple of video clips uh, that I'll use. One is uh, that I'll be starting w uh, fairly early on with, uh, just a clip of him, of his arrival uh, and his tour around Dublin. It's only a three minute clip uh, and then at the end I have the uh, farewell clip again which only lasts a couple of minutes. Uh, the only thing to keep in mind about those is that they were made 60 years ago as well. They haven't been digitally remastered uh, so the quality isn't, uh, isn't great. But we tested her out before we started the program so it sounds, it sounds okay. So without further ado, I will start on my presentation. So I'm going to bring you through a PowerPoint presentation slide by slide. Uh, the presentation will be available if anybody would like to get a copy of it. Uh, but as Rachel said, you can, you'll be able to get the recording from, from, uh, from the posting on YouTube. So. So here's a, a family picture, if you like. This is uh, JFK with some of his long uh, lost uh, relatives, or not, not so much lost, but uh, relatives uh, down in County uh, Wexford. And uh, apparently they all had a great time while he was there. So 2017 uh, was the centenary uh, for, for JFK, and I did quite a number of talks uh, in 2017 about his visit. Believe it or not, that's the birthplace of Patrick Kennedy, his great grandfather. Um, and it's still, the place is still there and will be preserved as a piece of our national heritage. So I'm going to start now with a three minute clip about uh, that covers his arrival uh, and his, his, I suppose, his drive about in Dublin city. So. Here we go, folks. June 26, 1963 is a memorable day in the life of Ireland. This is the day the Irish people anxiously awaited. For today, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, President of the United States, arrives among them. On his arrival at Dublin Airport, President Kennedy is greeted by American-born Eamon de Valera, the 80-year-old President of Ireland. Replying to his welcome, President Kennedy referred to himself as one of millions of Irish descent who had kept a place in their ancestral memory for the green and misty isle. And in that sense, he was indeed returning home. As President Kennedy inspects the honor guard, thousands crowd the surrounding buildings to get a glimpse at this dominant world leader, whose courage and zeal had rekindled hope in the hearts of free men. The greeting given to President Kennedy in Ireland had a warmness and depth surpassing anything experienced by any previous visitor to Ireland. This greeting also expressed... 
esteem of the Irish people for the United States, with the remembrance that the United States contributed so much to the hopes of the Irish nation during the dark days of the 18th and 19th centuries. Leaving the airport, the motorcade made its way through O'Connell Street in the heart of Dublin. Thousands have lined the streets for hours to honor the first American president who has come to visit them. On the following morning, President Kennedy visits Arbor Hill and lays a wreath on the grave of the executed leaders of the 1916 Rising. The president was so impressed by the soldierly bearing of the honor guard of young cadets that he later requested a film of their drill movements to be sent to him in Washington. The memorial service at Arbor Hill was, in the president's own words, the highlight of his visit to Ireland. So the place th that the Kennedy Homestead in is uh, an area called Dungan's Town, uh, near the town of New Ross. And there now is a, it, it's a visitor center now. And when you go there, you'll be brought around um, and see the old family home. Um, and also at the center, uh, there's a lot of history that you can explore. Uh, through various media um, so and also in that in that center you can trace the history of many others also who left Dungan's town uh, as he did on an immigrant ship to and most of them went to the slums of Boston the center has an interpretive exhibit which traces his story or the story of Patrick Kennedy leaving as a famine emigrant and then it covers that up to the point then where his great-grandchildren's uh, return in later years. Uh, there's um, various exhibits there incorporating audiovisuals, uh, photographs, and there's a historical interpretive display. So if you're in the area, it's well worth calling in to see. Now the Kennedy political dynasty can trace their Irish roots and I'm talking about the Kennedy political dynasty here in the US as, as distinct from the Kennedy political dynasty in Ireland. Um, so the American dynasty traces its roots to Dungan's town in Wexford. Patrick Kennedy, the great grandfather of John, Bobby and Teddy, among others, but they're the most uh, well known of the family, left Ireland in 1848 to escape the grinding poverty and the famine or the great hunger. It's believed that uh, Patrick had actually already met his future wife, Bridget Murphy, who was from the area uh, before he left for America. She followed him over later and they married uh, not too long afterwards in 1849 in the Cathedral of the Holy Cross uh, and that was known at the time as the grandest Catholic church in Boston. Then as each generation of the Kennedys was born, the family moved up in the world, I suppose is one way of putting it. Uh, Bridget took over their successful station restore after her husband, Patrick, he died from cholera. Their youngest son, Patrick J. Kennedy, went on to become a successful Boston politician, winning five consecutive one-year terms in the Massachusetts House of Representatives, and then three two-year terms in the Senate. Then his son, Joseph P. Kennedy, became a leading member of the Democratic Party and became the US ambassador to the UK. And as I said, his most famous sons were John, Bobby and Teddy. Now the visit to Ireland was very significant in, in lots of ways. 
Um, and I suppose the simplest way to put it was that it's seen as a famous moment in Irish history. Uh, knowing Irish history, what greater event might you have than a returning, um, you know, uh, the the the, the uh, a relative of uh, of an emigrant who left, uh, now returning as leader of the strongest and biggest uh, nation in the world. Now, while he was there in Ireland, obviously he went and he visited Dunganstown to see the family farm and to visit his many relatives down there, lots of cousins. He also saw the docks of the town of New Ross from where his great grandfather boarded a ship called the Dun Brody. And if you want to search you know, on the internet, you can get um, a lot of history about that particular boat. Now speaking at a ceremony in nearby New Ross, um, JFK paid tribute to his Irish heritage in these words. He said, when my great grandfather left here to become a cooper in East Boston, he carried nothing with him except two things, a strong religious faith and a strong desire for liberty. I'm glad to say that all his grandchildren have valued that inheritance. Um, so yes, that was the ceremony. Now, the, there's a huge and beautiful arboretum there that's dedicated to his memory. Um, and it's a plant, it contains a plant collection of international standing. It covers 623 acres on the southern slopes and summit of Sleeve Quilcha. It contains 4,500 types of trees and shrubs from all temperate regions of the world planted in botanical sequence. There's 200 forest plots grouped by continent and special features include an ericaceous garden with 500 different rhododendrons and many varieties of, azale of azaleas and heathers. There's dwarf conifers, hedges, ground covers and climbing plant. Um, the lake is the most popular part of the ar ar arboretum and it's a haven for waterfowl. And then there's a road there that provides access to the summit uh, at 900 feet uh, and you get beautiful panoramic views from, from there, the whole area. Now in terms of the Kennedy name, there's two origins of the Kennedy name, uh, one Scottish and the other Irish. Now, the most commonly known Kennedy family is the Irish one, made famous by the late US President JFK, whose ancestors came from County Wexford. Now the Irish Kennedys take their name from Kennedy, who was a nephew of the High King of Ireland, Brian Brew. And Brian Brew was famous as the High King who successfully uh, defeated the Vikings at the Battle of Clontarf in 1014. And that defeat ended the military might of the Vikings, not just in Ireland, uh, but abroad as well, because they committed forces from um, all over the British Isles and further afield into that battle and the battle was so bloody that most of the leaders on both sides uh, ended up dead and uh, so from Ireland's point of view it was a, a welcome outcome because that uh, put an end if you like to the perpetual threat which had been there for over 200 years um, of a Viking takeover. Osgeilige or in Irish uh, Kennedy is O Kineda uh, and Kennedy is just the anglicized form of that. Now the name Kineda was first used by Brian, brother, uh, Brian Baru's father, uh, Kenetic McLurkin. So Kenetic is the root, if you like, of Kineda and he was a king of Thomond in the 10th century AD. Uh, Brian Baru then later became uh, the, the Ard Ri or the High King of Ireland and his grandson then became known as O Kineda, which is Irish for grandson of Kineda. So the difference between the O and the Mac, the O means uh, grandson or descendant of, the, uh, if, if the name is a Mac, it means son of. Uh, now the Kennedys did not descend directly from Brian Baru, but from his brother, because uh, as I said, uh, there was a big family. So. The root of the word in Irish is helmeted head. Um, and we get that apparently because the original Canada was apparently the first Irishman to wear a helmet 
in battle against the Vikings. So he must have got a kind of a nickname and it stuck. Now this is remembered in the Kennedy coat of arms which features three helmets and I'll be showing that to you in a moment. Now the Irish Kennedys were the uh, they're described as being the left hand of the powerful Dalgash tribe of Tolmond that was headed by the O'Briens. Um, the right hand of the O'Briens was the McNamaras and the left hand was the Kennedys. Now they resided in eastern Clare, northern Limerick, Mayo and northern Tipperary uh, in an area called Ormond. And Ormond is just an old Irish word that translates into East Munster. So there is the uh, three helmets on the coat of arms uh, and they represented uh, the Fionn, Don and Rua branches. And I'll be explaining those because they're, they're three different uh, colours. But that's what they represent, the three different uh, branches. As I said, the Irish Kennedys were a member of the Dal Gash or sometimes referred to as the Dal Cassian sept. Now originally seated in a place called Glamour near Killaloon County Clare, they migrated across the River Shannon to Ormond, um, which is the East Munster, mainly in County Tipperary, following pressure from other septs in the region, mainly from the O'Briens and their right-hand people, the McNamaras. So they soon grew in power to become lords of that area, Ormond, from the 11th to the 16th centuries. Now the Annals of the Four Masters, uh, which is a compilation of works that was produced in the 17th, uh, 17th, 18th century uh, that um, attempted to put together notes that had been made uh, for well over the previous 1,000 years. There was a habit in Ireland in the monasteries of people keeping essentially diaries of the main events and the main uh, and what happened to the main uh, people in Ireland. There wasn't much narrative. So it would be something like, on so such and such a day, uh, this famous person was in a battle. Then there may be some uh, details, small details about the battle. Very little uh, in, in terms of uh, understanding, but they, they are useful. So they were described um, in, 19, in 1300 to be the undisputed lords of Ormond. And if you go around the place today, you're going to see place names such as Cool Kennedy, Gary Kennedy, in Upper Ormond and uh, Killo Kennedy um, in Tholmond, uh, which was part of the original area that they were in. Um, and that's indicative of their long-standing presence in the region. Now the Sept split into three branches. I referred to that when I showed you the uh, helmets there. The chiefs of which were referred to by their hair colours. Don was for the brown, Fionn for the blonde and Rua for the red. Now, St. Ruadon of Laura was the special protector of the Kennedys. Now, around 16, the year 1600, a branch of the Sept migrated to County Antrim, where many Kennedys are still found today, alongside uh, uh, some living there, some Kennedys that may be of Scottish origin, because County Antrim is very close to Scotland. At one point, there's only 13 miles uh, between Ireland and Scotland. Just a couple of facts about the name. It's the 16th most common surname in Ireland, with approximately 20,000 uh, bearers. In the USA, it's the 137th most common surname, and there's about 185,000, a lot more than in Ireland. And in Scotland, uh, it is the 58th most common surname. Now, the Kennedys had castles, as lords and kings would have. And the Kennedys' castles in Ireland were all located near a place called Nina in North Tipperary. And the following castles were built by or held by the Kennedys. Ballantotti Castle, Drummoneer Castle, Gary Kennedy Castle, Nina Castle and Lachine Castle. So again, if you're uh, touring the south of Ireland and going to be in, um, in, in Munster, you might look out for some of those castles. Now we move on to the Fitzgeralds. And this here is the Thomas Fitzgerald Centre in Bruff County, Limerick. Now the story connecting the rural town of Bruff in County Limerick and the 35th President of the United States began in 1852 and it was then following the Great Hunger or Famine uh, which is known in, in Ireland as Ungurta Moor 
uh, that a young emigrant, Thomas Fitzgerald, left his native home in Brough and made his way to the US or to America in search of a better life. He settled in Boston, where he worked hard and prospered. And one of his sons, John Honey Fitzgerald, was a three-time mayor of Boston. And his grandson, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, would be elected by the House of Representatives to the US Congress and become the 35th President of the United States. Now the Thomas Fitzgerald Center was formerly uh, an old courthouse and it was officially dedicated in memory of Thomas Fitzgerald not too long ago, only 10 years ago, in June 2013. And the dedication uh, there was done when Caroline Kennedy came over, and uh, that was his daughter. And every generation of the Fitzgerald Kennedy family have visited their ancestral home in Brough. The centre now displays an array of photographs, including some from the visit of President John F. Kennedy in 1963, the visit of Caroline uh, to Brough in 2013, and also includes photographs of many other members of the Fitzgerald and Kennedy family. Now, the centre is also home to a hand-painted mural depicting the Fitzgerald family tree, the only one of its type in the world. And that's, that's it there. And again, if, you, uh, if you're ever in the area, go into the, uh, to the Brough uh, Centre um, and you will see it in much greater relief than what you can see there on the slide. Now the Fitzgeralds and the, uh, the Irish for Fitzgerald is Mac Geralt. Now the name itself is derived, because it's, it's not an Irish name, Fitzgerald uh, is, is a Norman name. Um, so the name is derived from the Norman personal name Gerald, and that consists of the Germanic elements, uh, elements Jerry or Gary, which means spear, and Wald, which means rule. Now the name features the distinctive Irish patronymic prefix uh, Fitz, which means son of. So Fitz would, does the same thing as Mock in Irish. So Fitz is used by the Normans to mean son of. So it's son of in Anglo-French. Now it's derived from the old French word fils, which ultimately comes from the Latin word filius. And the Gaelic form of the surname Fitzgerald is Mock Geralt, son of Gerald. The Fitzgerald dynasty, it's an Irish Hiberno Norman uh, or Cambro Norman royal dynasty. The Cambro is just the, the Latin word for Wales because the original, um, the original uh, in, in, in Norman invaders that came to Ireland in 1169 came from Wales. Um, and then over time, then they became, after the first generation, I suppose, just like you have Irish Americans now, they, can, they became Irish Hiberno Norman. Um, they have been peers of Ireland since at least the 14th century and are identified in the annals of the Four Masters um, as being more Irish than the Irish themselves. Now, this was something that was said by the English, not by, by the Irish, because the English were not very happy that the people that they sent over to Ireland turned out to be to look like the Irish, speak Irish, and uh, behave in many ways like the Irish. So saying that they were more Irish than the Irish themselves wasn't intended as a, a compliment. Uh, it was to put them down. But anyway, that's what they did. They became more Irish than the Irish themselves, due basically to assimilation with the native uh, Gaelic arist aristocratic uh, and, and, and popular culture. Now, the dynasty was also ref referred to as the Geraldines. Um, anybody that's descended from Gerald of Wales, like the Fitzgeralds, um, Fitz, uh, well, I won't go into it in detail. There were other sons of, of Gerald of Wales, but the Fitzgerald comes from him. Now, they were established in Ireland by a conquest, uh, which involved the confiscation of large swaths of Irish territory uh, by the grandsons of Gerald Fitzwalter of Windsor and the Fitzgeralds come from this Gerald Fitzwalter because son of Gerald is what Fitzgerald is. Now Gerald was a Norman castellan from Wales and he is the male progenitor of the Fitzgerald and Fitzmaurice dynasty. Um, now Gerald's Welsh wife who was Ness Fertrees, she is the female progenitor of both the Fitzgeralds and the Fitzmaurice. Now she was the daughter of Rhys ap Tudor, who was the last king 
of Dehu Bart in Wales. Now through her, the Fitzgeralds and Fitzmorrises are descended from the Welsh rulers of that area, Dehu Bart, um, as well as being related to the Tudors who were descended from the same Welsh line. And the Tudor family were, uh, we know them in popular history as uh, people like Henry VIII, Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, um, and uh, Henry VIII, his father was Henry VII. So there's a whole line of them uh, from around 1485 up to the time that Queen Elizabeth died, Queen Elizabeth I died uh, in 1603. So they are re were related to them. So consequently, the Fitzmorrises and Fitzgeralds are cousins of those Tudors through Nest and her Welsh family. Now the main branches uh, of the family are the Fitzmorrises and the Fitzgeralds of Kildare, who became Earls of Kildare from 1316. Later they became Marquesses of Kildare, and from 1766 they became Dukes of Leinster and Premier Peers of Ireland. Now the current head is Morris Fitzgerald, who is the ninth Duke of Leinster. But in Ireland today, we don't recognise any of those old, uh, you know, titles. But still, within the family, it's probably some kind of a novelty at this stage. But um, but most of and, and not just the Fitzgeralds, but all of the Irish clans in the last thirty to forty years, they have formed uh, organisations to attempt to piece together their clan history. Uh, and part of that then is to establish the kind of lineal, uh, if, if you like, the descendants of people and to try to establish who, if you like, is at the top of the chain today. And most of them uh, have established that. Now, the Fitz, Fitzmorrises and Fitzgeralds of Desmond, uh, and Desmond uh, is just a, a, a word for South Munster. Um, uh, and Barons Desmond, then later they became the Earls of Desmond, so again, they were all barons, earls, dukes. They, they were, those were all the titles that were imported from the feudal period in, in England and Europe. Now, the Fitzgerald dynasty has played a major role in Irish history. Uh, Gerard Moore, uh, Moore is an Irish word which means great. So that literally translates into uh, Gerald the Great. He was the eighth Earl of Kildare and his son, uh, Gerard uh, Og, uh, which means Gerard the Young, who was the next Earl, the ninth Earl. They were Lord Deputies of Ireland in the late 15th and early 16th centuries. So as Lord Deputies, they were in charge of the England's affairs in, in Ireland. Uh, that was the, the job of the people who descended from the original Norman invasion. Uh, that was their, essentially their role in Ireland, um, was to do the King's bidding in Ireland. Now Thomas Fitzgerald, the tenth Earl, um, he was known as Silk and Thomas. Now he led an unsuccessful insurrection in Ireland, um, and then later on there was another Fitzgerald, Lord Edward Fitzgerald. He was the fifth son of the first Duke of Leinster, and he was a leading figure in the 1798 rebellion. So, I suppose to the simplest way to put it is that while their origin uh, lay within the invasion of Ireland from the neighbor neighbouring island. They considered themselves Irish, and even though they, uh, their power came from their association with the crown, a lot of the time they were in opposition to the crown. And sometimes they were only in power in Ireland simply because uh, the crown in England could not get anyone more suited or better equipped or militarily more prepared than they were. And the crown risked uh, a lot if they didn't accept the, the, the if, if you like, a, a significant role for Fitzgeralds. Problem was, eventually that was going to come to an end, and it did in the reign of Henry VIII. Henry VIII wanted to get rid of them, and that's what he did. Uh, he did that in the 1830s, um, when he, basically he rounded up all of the male line of the Fitzgeralds, put them in the Tower of London, and executed them all. And that was the end of the, the Fitzgeralds as we knew them for hundreds of years. Now, the English did not eliminate all of the men, or all of the male line. There was one uh, ten-year-old boy who managed to escape. Uh, and eventually, um, after Henry VIII um, died, 
um, because of the politics in England, uh, he ended up being restored with his titles and land in Ireland. Um, so there's a long, a long history, which I don't have time to get into tonight, but they played a, a huge role. If any of you have been in Dublin, you may have visited Leinster House, which is where Doyle Aaron, the Government of Ireland, sits. And that used to be their big house, Leinster House. That was first built in 1745 by James Fitzgerald, or for James Fitzgerald, who was the first Duke of Leinster. Leinster. And this was the palace, the Ducal pa Palace, in other words, the palace for the Dukes uh, of Leinster. Now, the Fitzgeralds and Fitzmaurice dynasty became so intermingled with the native Irish that they were later often described uh, primarily by the English, but it became common, particularly when they lost power, uh, to see them as more Irish than the Irish themselves. Uh, and uh, the best example uh, would be the third Earl of Desmond, who was also known by the Irish Gaelic Gerard Irla, or Earl Gerald. So although he was made Lord Chief Justice of Ireland in 1367, um, and one of his jobs as Lord Chief Justice would have been to ensure that, um, first of all, that English law applied in Ireland, and that tr the traditions from England were adhered to, but he, he didn't do that. He wrote poetry in the Irish language, and the most famous one uh, that he wrote was one that translates into Speak Not Ill of Womankind. So uh, he, he wasn't an accomplished poet in, in Norman French, but he was instrumental in the move by the Fitzgeralds and Fitzmaurice, uh, Fitz, the Fitzmaurices and Fitzgerald of Munster, or Desmond is, is just part of Munster, uh, and that was a move towards a greater use of the Irish language, something that would have sent the king in England into ap apoplexy, as we would call it. Now, if you use this link here, there are seven speeches that were made by JFK uh, in Ireland, and that link there will bring you to those, and it, it lasts for 41 minutes. So you can either copy what's written there and uh, you know, copy it into your browser. If you wish and you have a copy of this presentation, when you're in uh, the, 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 you know, the, the mode that we're in now for presentation mode, uh, you can just click on it. But I'm not going to click on it here, but I'll leave that for you to do. So we'll move on uh, to Patrick Kennedy's wife, Bridget Murphy. She was born in Dungenstown, same as he. In a, he uh, she was born in 1821. And she uh, followed him to America and married him uh, on September the 26th, 1849, in the Holy Redeemer Church. And the celebrant was Father John Williams, who later became Boston's Roman Catholic Archbishop. Now, after he died of cholera, Bridget worked as a maid for an affluent Protestant family and faced quite a lot of discrimination, just like lots of Irish did at the time. Uh, then she worked at a stationery and notion store. With the help of her daughters, she was able to purchase the store, and then she added groceries and liquor to the inventory. She died uh, in December of 1888 in Boston. Now, Murphy is the most common surname in Ireland, the 14th most common surname in Northern Ireland, the second most common surname in Canada, and the 58th most common surname in the United States. Now, Murphy is the anglicised version of two Irish surnames, MacMurkita and O Murkita. And again, the difference there is the Macs are the sons of Murkita, and the O means descendant of, of Murkita. So they both are derived from the early Irish personal name Murkida, meaning Sea Warrior. Um, and the name derives from a number of Gaelic uh, Murkida septs, the main ones of which uh, were located in Cork, Carlow, Armagh and Wexford. Now the most prominent were the Wexford uh, Omoricas, um, um, or Murphys, who took their surname from uh, Murkida, which anglicised its said uh, it's spoken as Murrah. Now Murrah was the grandfather of Dermot MacMurrah who was the King of Leinster and he was the one um, who was also responsible um, for the Norman invasion. So in a way he was the one who was responsible for the fact that the Fitzgeralds ended up uh, in, in Ireland and that we have Fitzgeralds in Ireland today. 
Now the Cork Murphys, well, a section of the clan moved uh, to County Cork and County Kerry in the early 17th century, and they're particularly associated with the barony of Muskerry. Um, now John Murphy, better known as Sean O'Murrico, uh, he was the last chief of the famous bards of Blarney Castle, and I'm sure you've all heard of Blarney Castle. Now the last person in the group, um, Roxana Cox. Now that's what's left of the family homestead uh, today. Now she was born in 1836 in, in Tunnymore, um, in uh, what was uh, at the time County Cavan, but over the, because it was very close to the Cavan from Manor uh, border, and it appears that over the years, slight movements in the boundaries, um, some of which had to do uh, with the creation of the border in, in, in Ireland, um, meant that um, she, uh, there's a, a case now that, that, that where she was originally born in County Cavan, that that's now in County Fermanagh. And as we know, she was the great grandmother of JFK. Um, she was wife, the wife of Thomas Fitzgerald. They got married on the 4th of November, 1857 in, in Boston. So she was the grandmother of Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. Uh, she gave birth to 12 children in a short lifespan. Uh, nine of those lived to adulthood. She had a tragic end. She died suddenly on the 12th of March, 1879 when she heard a rumour that her entire family had been killed in a train wreck on their way to their Sunday school picnic. The rumour was false, but unfortunately she died from shock. You can imagine. Now, while uh, JFK was in, in Wexford, um, he visited the John Barry Memorial at Crescent Quay in Wexford town. And I'll explain to you who this John Barry was. John Barry was born uh, in Wexford uh, in 1745 and when his family uh, was evicted from their home by the British landlord they moved to Ross Lair on the coast where his uncle worked uh, a fishing skiff and as a young man Barry uh, he was determined uh, John Barry was determined upon a life as a seaman and he started out as a ship's cabin boy eventually John Barry became an officer in the Continental Navy uh, during the American Revolutionary War and later in the United States Navy. He came to be widely credited and is known in the history books as the father of the American Navy and was appointed a captain in the Continental Navy in December of 1775. That he was the first captain placed in command of a US warship commissioned for service under the Continental flag. And after the war, he became the first commissioned US Naval officer at the rank of Commodore receiving his commission from President George Washington in 1797. So now um, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes here. Uh, this will be the coverage um, in relation to the departure of JFK. He was one of their own. He was the President of the United States. Actually, you could say that the Irish people elected him President, and now he was going home to thank their cousins. And, uh, but, you know, it's the kind of a welcome you'd give a cousin, you know, just like uh, in the poem. Years of exile, years of pain. Oh, to see old Shannon's face again. Well, he's part of that. He was coming back to them. And they felt it. Because it wasn't just the young. It went up to the youngest and the oldest person in Iowa was proud of it. Here it is, the Shannon's brightly glancing stream, brightly gleaming. Silent in the morning beam, oh, the sight of transit. Thus returned from travels long, years of exile, years of pain, to see old Shannon's face again, oh, the water's glancing. Well, I'm uh, going to come back and see old Shannon's face again. And I'm 
taking, uh, as I go back to America, all of you with me. Thank you. So there's, uh, for those of you who um, would like to get a copy of the presentation, because uh, obviously <laughs> you wouldn't have to write this down here, uh, this on Google, uh, this will bring you to images uh, of the visit to Dongan's town. So somebody took a lot of photographs uh, while he was there, um, and there's a lot of them uh, that you can have a look at if you're interested in on Google. And also there's images for that uh, arboretum um, that I uh, discussed at the very very beginning and again that link there will bring you to see some of those wonderful pictures of the Arboretum. So I teach uh, Irish history and I've got a couple of I, I do month-long courses uh, once a week on a Thursday um, so I'll just show you the ones I have there's one ongoing now I'm in March and then there's one starting next uh, uh, next month and uh, that's my email address there. Um, I also have a, a website which is irishhistory.online. So the ones that are ongoing at the moment, one week is uh, completed, it's on the, the history of County Kildare and the second one uh, it's part of my course, uh, it's a course that covers the entirety of Irish history from the physical formation of Ireland uh, over 340 million years ago um, or 430 million years ago up to the present day. This particular course deals with the period from 1980 to 1998 uh, from the period of the hunger strikes uh, up to the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. And then in April I'm doing the history of uh, the adjacent an adjacent county to Kildare, County Offaly and then I'm dealing with the history of the Republic of Ireland from 1998 up to the present day. So now I'll go back to you and I will take any questions or comments that you may have and try my best to answer them for you, fill in any gaps from the presentation. Um, also, I'll just show you what I have here if you do get the presentation. Um, there's a speech to the Irish Parliament and that's a six minute there's a speech that he made at the homestead, which is four minutes, and then he, he visited Galway as well, so those speeches are all available. Um, then, this is one that was produced at his homestead uh, shortly after his death. So it's a short uh, three minute uh, program uh, of, I suppose, grieving on his death. Uh, there are a number of videos that are, are, are available. One is his arrival in <coughs> Dublin Airport, 
There's a documentary about it called Island of Dreams, which is a 40 minutes. There's the departure which we've seen. His favourite song was We Are the Boys of Wexford. Um, so that brings you in that in there. There's also a song he liked uh, about two sweethearts, one being his mother, somebody, a person having to choose between his sweetheart and his mother. Um, so that's a book that's useful, but I'm sure uh, if you ask the librarian, you will find out what wants to have in your local library. Uh, so that being said, uh, I will come back to you.